Okay, let's begin with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath hours, the blessings that we receive in fellowship with you and in fellowship with each other on the Sabbath. We ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to be here. We give our hearts to you. We dedicate our lives to you. And we ask, Lord, that as we share and study here this evening, that we will be drawn closer to you and to each other and that we will more uh, nearly reflect the character of Christ. Uh, we pray for the Sabbath day, we pray for this message and the various meetings and communications that occur. Uh, we ask Lord that your angels can be around us and that your Holy Spirit can work in our lives and that uh, the work of the enemy that is seeking to destroy uh, can be thwarted. We ask Lord for strength, to walk in the light uh, and courage and faith. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> so the study of uh, the study today, uh, this evening, is is a bit of a preparation for tomorrow for the sermon, uh, where I'm going to deal with the prediction before midnight. And of course, that's connected to Samuel Snow's letters and to Ezekiel. And I wanted to look this morning at the connections uh, between Ezekiel and Snow. So it's a little bit different kind of study uh, than I'm used to doing. Now, I want to look at Ezekiel chapter one and just go over some obvious things first that, that we know about Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter one, verse one and two, it says, now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God and in the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity. Um, and he's going to go on there. But the main element is this chronological element. And we will see how this applies. But we know that this, this fifth day of the fourth month is July 21st, 592 B.C., and it's, it's midnight, as, as we know. Now, uh, to sort of address this a little bit, I'm going to be looking at, at some of the chronology of Samuel Snow's letters and some of the chronology of Ezekiel. But I want to really go beyond the chronology. So I'm going to start by asking some questions. And, and we're going to write them on the board, the, the answers that we get. So, here we go. Um, not sure why it's doing that. This is, it has to do with the recording here. I got to get this so that I got the right picture. Hmm. Okay, I'm not sure. I, this has to do with my recording. I'm trying to get it so I just have the one screen and it ends up being a split screen, which it shouldn't be. Okay, so. I don't know why it's doing that. I've never had it do that before. Um, doesn't make the recording very good if you have a split screen like that. You guys probably wouldn't notice what's happening here. It's just not going very good here. It's not coming across, you're right. 
Yeah. Well, what are you guys seeing? You? I don't, I don't see anything. Yeah. Well, yeah. See, I have, it's, it's supposed to be the speaker view, but it's giving me a gallery view and it won't go to the speaker view. So not sure why. Uh, there. There's your screen now. Yeah. Okay. So that's showing up. It's showing the screen behind me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, um, It's not doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so here, I'm going to change something here. There we go. I know what I did wrong. Okay, so so we have, uh, I'm gonna ask, ask some questions regarding Ezekiel. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna put Ezekiel and we're gonna have snow. And I wanna compare these two. So what are things that Ezekiel and snow have in common with each other? They're both chronologists. Okay, so um, someone here said that they're both are chronologists. That is, they both have dates. Now, um, now they both are doing chronology to some degree. They're both predicting things with dates. Um, so they both uh, deal with chronology, right? So they both have chronology. And, and we can also look at differences between them. What, what, what other things do we see? I know you haven't thought about this, so it's gonna take a little bit to process it. But just think about some of the obvious things. We, we just read Ezekiel chapter one, verse one. So what is it about snow and Ezekiel that they have in common? But there's also some differences. So think about uh, the fifth day of the fourth month that we read about in Ezekiel. In one way of looking at it, they're both kind of in captivity. Okay, so it talked about them in captivity. They're, so we know Ezekiel is literally in captivity in Babylon. How is snow in captivity? In not understanding what the Bible really says. Okay, so his captivity is a lack of understanding. Right. Now, how is that a captivity? Well, he's not recognizing the time in which he's living. I mean, Ezekiel is recognizing the fact that he's living in a time that um, Judah is going to be in captivity and he has been taken in captivity. So, okay. so they, one, one is recognizing the point that he's been taken and the other is not recognizing the point that his captivity is soon to end. Okay. Now with, with Samuel Snow, um, he isn't aware, well, he does know about the 2520 both for, for Judah. He's not aware of the 2520 for Israel, but that 2520 has ended. And um, the Millerite movement occurs in a period between uh, the end of the first 2520 and the end of the second. But it's after 1844 that God begins to gather Judah, a spiritual Judah together to create a denominated people. So, Snow understands some things, but he doesn't understand everything. Now, as far as Ezekiel, he knows about this. Now, what about the dates uh, that we have in Ezekiel and Snow and Snow's letters 
and in the history of snow. What's, what's the, the most important date? If we can attach importance to dates in their personal, in their personal life. What's the central date um, in, their, in their personal experience? If that makes sense. Can you tell us already? The fifth day, fourth month? The fifth day, fourth month? I said, did you tell us already? No, I didn't tell you. I'm just guessing. Yeah, it's the fifth day, the fourth month. Now, when we think about it with snow, the fifth day of the fourth month is the center of what? The midnight cry chiasm. Okay, so it's it's the center of a chiasm. It goes from the first day of the first month to the tenth day of the seventh month. And so this chiasm, this structure, um, Snow is not aware of it, right? So he doesn't know about this. Now in Ezekiel, he has this. He also has the fifth day of the fourth month, but that's when he begins his ministry. So the book of Ezekiel begins with the fifth day of the fourth month, and then it's going to end with the 10th day of the seventh month. So Ezekiel, his prophesying in a symbolic sense occurs from midnight to the day of atonement, even though he does have one other prophecy earlier in the book that it deals with a date later, but this is how the book is structured. So what's the difference here between snow and Ezekiel? If, if we look at this, Because we have a chiasm here, right? Do we have a chiasm in Ezekiel? No. Okay, and, and somebody said no. Uh, why not? Because there isn't a line in the middle. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> but why does Ezekiel not have a chiasm? Because... Because we say that Ezekiel typifies snow, right? So we, they both we typify us. And they both, tip, okay, there you go. Okay, so they both typify us. So what, what do we have here when we take Ezekiel and snow and then we apply it to our line? What do we call that? A triple application of prophecy. Okay, a triple application of prophecy. And, and why is that important? Why does Ezekiel have some elements and snow have other elements. What, what is the reason for that? Well, it's, it's to show us the end from the beginning. Okay, well, it shows us the end from the beginning. Well, they're two different people. You have different perspectives on things. Okay, so if we take something like the first woe and the second woe, we know that they're both dealing with Islam but they have some differences regarding them. Um, so God takes two different histories that have similarities but differences and he combines them into another history, the third woe. Why does he do that? So that we can understand what's going to happen in the future. Mm. Okay. so. He says, so we can understand what's going to happen in the future. How, how do we do that? Anybody want to expand on that? The end dictates the end from the beginning. You know what's well, going to happen from the end based on what happens at the beginning. Yeah, but, but we have two different histories that are similar, but they have differences. And why doesn't God make them the same? And just have, you know, one the same as the next? And it'd be the same as ours. Because we wouldn't learn anything. Well, we wouldn't learn anything. Okay. Well, I mean, we still might learn something. It might be easier. Right. But we wouldn't be challenged in the way that we need to be challenged. I, don't, I, I know. I'm asking people questions that they may not have thought about. Um, something. What's that? Try again. I, I heard Maybe there's something to learn from the differences. Okay, I didn't catch everything you say said. 
it's a little bit distorted for some reason. Maybe there's something to learn from the differences. Something to learn from the differences. Okay, right? I think so. Now, these differences, um, because there are different aspects of Ezekiel that relate to our line and different aspects of snow that relate to our line. Now, sure, it'd be easier if they were identical, but if they were identical, we wouldn't need both lines. And God is giving, showing us something. He's wanting us to understand something about how he works. We know that we can look at histories. We can look at, um, for instance, if we look at the beginning of ancient Israel and the end of ancient Israel, we know that they say something um, or the, the beginning of literal Israel and the end of literal Israel, however you want to say it. Uh, that they have similarities to each other, but they're not identical to each other. We can lay out a structure that's the same. We can see the reform line, but they're not identical in every way. And, and each reform line, why does a reform line exist? Or what's the purpose of a reform line? To take people out of darkness. Ah, to take people out of darkness. Reform line. And, and what's the particular characteristic of of each reform line what defines the characteristics of that reform line not the structure of it but the characteristics of it, it it's, it's an answer to get us out of darkness what what why does a reform line deal with certain aspects it's certain generations have certain problems right so there's a particular uh darkness that each reform line is addressing so we know that all these histories are not identical. Uh, they have a different darkness. And so the reform line expresses itself in a different way. Now, I'm just trying to get you to think a little bit because I want, want you to see something about Snow and Ezekiel, especially tomorrow I'm gonna, gonna bring this out. But if we're going to parallel uh, Samuel Snow's letters. If we look at Samuel Snow's letters, where do they occur in this line? Do they occur before midnight or after midnight? Before. Okay, so they occur before midnight. Now, when is Ezekiel prophesying? After midnight. After midnight. Why is that? What is the work of Ezekiel typifying? Because I say that Ezekiel typifies snow. But what is Ezekiel typifying? He would obviously be typifying something after snow. So he, he, would, he would be typifying uh, the, the Levites, I guess. Okay, typifying the Levites? I don't know what you're asking. <laughs> yeah. I, Okay, one of the things we, we notice, if we go to the book of Ezekiel, does anybody know how many dates there are uh, that are listed in the book of Ezekiel that, that are named by name? Because you don't know, Okay, somebody said seven. That's a good guess. It's wrong, but <laughs> there's actually 13 dates, right? So he has 13 dates here from the fifth day of the fourth month to the 10th day of the seventh month in the book of Ezekiel, there's 13 dates. Now in Samuel Snow's letters, do you know how many dates are connected with his letters, either in the writing publishing of his letters? And I'm not just counting the ones uh, from February 16th. I'm counting all of his letters prior to midnight. So this is going to start before the first day of the first month. Does anybody know how What's that? Eight, eight letters? Well, okay, there's... Well, not, well, not eight, four. There's four letters, right? Well, there's, there's, there's more than four letters if you count all of his letters. Now, there's, there's four letters that deal directly with um, the prediction of the 10th day of the seventh month. Mm -hmm. right? So but there's actually more letters. He actually wrote some letters in 1842. Um, he did a sermon that was published. He did it on December... Uh, 31st, 1843, and then he has five letters 
One of them is not addressing uh, the tenth day of the seventh month or the or, or the prophecies as such. It's it's just a, it's just a letter uh, addressing uh, the disappointment and the mockers, but it's not addressing uh, the prediction per se. But if you count also the days the letters are written and the days that they're published and all the letters together, you end up with 13 dates. Um, now, of course, people could count this different ways, but I'm gonna just say there's 13 dates when I count it. Um, so one of the things we see is that there's a similarity between uh, Snow and Ezekiel. And even if it wasn't 13 dates, um, the point is that he has all these dates in his structure, and, and so does Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel has, there's another date that we have in Samuel Snow, and this is the fifth, uh, first day of the fifth month. Now, in Ezekiel, you'll see that he also has, uh, within these dates, he also has the first day of the first month. And he also has the first day of the fifth month. Uh, this one is a prophecy regarding Egypt. And this is a prophecy uh, regarding Tyre uh, when they mock uh, the Jews. <clears throat> so Ezekiel actually has four of the same dates that we see in this line. Here. So in this whole line of, of Millerite history from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, the primary four dates, not, not the letters, but the four dates, all those dates are mentioned directly in the book of Ezekiel, which is pretty remarkable. <coughs> now, Ezekiel, personally, what is Ezekiel? Who is he? He is a priest. Okay, so he's a priest, right? Now, is Samuel Snow a priest? He is a preacher, but he's not a priest. Yeah, yeah, and, and he's not even really a preacher. I mean, he's just a lay person um, who happens to hold some meetings and writing letters uh, to uh, to some of the periodicals at the time, mostly to the Midnight Cry, uh, to Brother Southerd, who he knew. Um, so he's just a lay person. So I wouldn't argue that he's a priest. You know, he's not an ordained minister. He's not a recognized minister in the movement. He's just a layman. Um, now, of course, Ezekiel is also a prophet. Is Samuel Snow a prophet? No. no. Okay. Yeah. So he's not a prophet. So he's a, he's a prophet, but Snow is not. So he's not a prophet. And why do we say he's not a prophet? He didn't prophesy. <laughs> now, you know, some people might argue that he is because he's making a prediction, right? So they say, well, he's a prophet. Now, he thought he was a prophet. Oh. Uh, that's the interesting thing about Samuel Snow is he believed that he was a prophet. He believed he was the prophet Elijah. Now, this becomes clear after the disappointment in 1844. But I believe it's something that Ezekiel, or that Ezekiel, that Snow believed about himself prior to him ever presenting a message, is that he believed he was a prophet. And, but I say he's not a prophet. But why would we say he's not a prophet? What's the arguments for him not being a prophet? Because he takes credit himself prophesying he doesn't really give god the credit well i don't know if that if makes somebody not a prophet i think so I think <laughs> you think so i think that's one of the signs well does ezekiel take credit that he's a prophet yeah but he, he, he ultimately gives the glory to god yeah okay well no i don't think so much just okay. what you just said or implied okay what make what makes somebody a prophet uh there are things that actually happen okay well sometimes was uh uh, Jonah a prophet? I, I don't understand what you're asking. Well, Jonah predicted that... Um, no, but no, your actual question doesn't make any sense. What What is a prophet? Yeah. How, how do you define yeah, a prophet? Because you're not accepting clearly correct answers. <laughs> well, we 
because we know that there are some prophets who make conditional prophecies and they don't necessarily come to pass, such as Jonah, mm -hmm. right? So he prophesied the destruction of Nineveh in 40 days and it didn't occur, but yet he was still a prophet, oh, right? So, so yeah, one of the things we would normally say is that a prophet, he prophesies it comes to pass. Um, Dwight, you have a comment on that or? What I was going to say was mm -hmm. that you could you could state that Jonah was a preacher of righteousness because right. when, he, when he went when he went to Nineveh, he gave a warning message, and that mm -hmm. warning message was that if they did not repent, they were going to be destroyed. Right. They repented. He was probably the greatest preacher outside of Christ to have ever lived, because everyone from the king all the way to the least in that city listened to what he said and repented yeah yeah so you know what makes somebody a prophet is they have a message given them from god and just studying the bible because we had this problem in our message where we were there was a suggestion that we were prophets uh because we were giving a message and that's sort of a loose uh definition of a prophet somebody who who gives the word of God. I mean, in that context, anybody who shares the Bible is a prophet, right? So, and, and what you would do is this, uh, this type of argument is a definitional argument. You take something like um, the word prophet and you take one definition of it and then you apply it in another way, which is, which is a rather deceptive thing to do. We know what we mean when we say a prophet in one sense, but just because we can use the word prophet or messenger or something in another sense, it doesn't mean that we then are prophets. Um, it's nothing special about, about that. Now, we do have a special message to give, which God has given us, but that doesn't make us prophets. Um, now, so some of these things, when we, when we look at this, and, and, and there's a reason, as you'll see as I, as I go through this, now, when we look at Snow's letters themselves, we have somewhat of a parallel between Snow's letters, which happened before the fifth day of the fourth month, and Ezekiel's prophecies that happen after the fifth day of the fourth month. So this gives us a big picture of things. Now, Ezekiel is different than Snow in that if you deal with this prophet side of it, did Ezekiel's prophecies come to pass? Yes. Yeah. Did Snow's prophecies come to pass? No. Some people might argue differently. But, but we would say no. That is, what he predicted didn't come to pass in any way that he expected it. And You know what they they and, and snow is an interesting case because he still tried to maintain uh the message that he gave the midnight cry at the beginning he doesn't he doesn't reject it fully uh as many of the millerites did he sees some truth in it but he sees himself as elijah and and he takes a very odd position uh towards the leadership in the millerite movement um he basically becomes an egotist, which is, which is very, very unfortunate. And um, people follow him for a while, but eventually, uh, you know, he ends up really with very few people following, just a handful of people. And he goes into different kinds of views. His views keep changing all the time. Uh, now, when we deal with, with this history, what is this history about from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month? What, what is this history? How would we define it? Because it's a part of Millerite history. What part is it of Millerite history? The midnight cry. Okay, well, it's the midnight cry. But if you but it's the second angel's message, right? 
this is the second angel's message. Because the second so, angel arrives here, and the so third angel would, arrives here. Would would we say that this this is the time of the empowerment of the second angel? Well, but first day of the first month, the second angel arrives. Right. So from the first day of the first month to the tenth day of the seventh month, you have the first the second angel arrive. It becomes formalized at midnight, even though the midnight cry is given, but the midnight cry is not empowered until the first day of the fifth month. Okay. Right. So, so this is the history of the second angel's message. Now we haven't dealt with Ezekiel. We're going to deal with this when we study Ezekiel and we get further on. We're going to start looking at the structure of Ezekiel more closely. Um, but Ezekiel is. If you look at the fifth day of the fourth month, even though this has this symbolic, uh, this symbol here that we see in Millerite history, and it connects us to Millerite history, this, what happens here is not analogous to what happens here from the fifth day of the fourth month to the tenth day of the seventh month, at least as far as certain areas of it are analogous, they, they, they parallel each other, but in here, if we are to draw this on a line, uh, this history, the line looks a lot different. The dates don't line up you know, where you see the time at the end in this history and you see um, you know, the first message coming and the second message and so forth. You can lay this all out. It doesn't, the dates don't line up the same. So just because this is the fifth day of the fourth month and is a symbol of midnight from Millerite history, the purpose of this symbol is to show us the connection to Samuel Snow, because Samuel Snow at midnight is going to give this message. But we focus upon these, these letters, right? So we focus upon Samuel Snow's letters. And, and, we're, and we're, I'm going to show this tomorrow in more detail. But Samuel Snow's letters, what do they parallel in our history? The letters themselves. So not Samuel Snow, but his letters. What do they parallel? The midnight cry. The false midnight cry. Okay, well. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry. That's, it's okay to guess. So Samuel Snow's letters, and we've dealt with this before. Even though there's some similarities between these prophecies in Ezekiel, in that they're connected with dates. And Samuel Snow's letters, we also recognize they're connected with dates. Samuel Snow's letters, if we're going to put them into our history, so if we go into our history here, so we're going to call this the history of the priests. Is this the mess? Is this the history of the second angel's message? Because uh, I, I haven't even placed where the priests are here. But is this the history of the second angel's message, the history of the priests? Where does where does the where do the priests begin in our line? Any thoughts on that? Because, you know, we because we talk about the line of the priests and, and where do we normally place the beginning of the line of the priests? 89. Okay, so we, we place it in 89. Is that correct? No. Okay. Why not? Because you, you had to have 30 years before a party could become a priest. Okay, so so we see that there is, there is this... Um, in 1989, uh, we, we can connect the priests in some ways. So how do we do that in Ezekiel? So when we dealt, dealt with this history, we read Ezekiel 1, verse 1. It was the fifth day of the fourth month. What, what else was it? 30 years from the Passover of Josiah. Right. So in 622, this Passover is connected by 30 years. Right, so the Passover of Josiah. And so Ezekiel is here at the fifth day of the fourth month. And at the fifth day of the fourth month, what does snow personally do? What, what, does, what happens to snow? 
on, on July 21st. I'm not understanding your analogy, so I don't really okay. have an answer. Okay, so here we have 30 years, right. and Ezekiel begins his prophesying. Now, in snow, we deal with snow's letters, but then on July 21st at midnight, snow is in Boston, and he gives the midnight cry, right? And it's, it's, it's this date here that, that becomes significant, just as this date here. But do we have 30 years here? Is snow 30 on July 21st uh, in 1844? Does anybody know when snow was born? Hang on. <laughs> oh, man. I, I'm pretty sure he wasn't 30 because I looked it up before. I just can't remember how old he is. Uh, no, he was born in 1806. Yeah. Yeah, he was born in, in yeah, in 1806. That's right. Okay. And um, so anyway, we, we have snow here. He's not 30. Now, Ezekiel, even though there's this 30 years that is part of the Jubilee cycle, we also assume that, that Ezekiel is 30 years old. And, you know, that's what most people just assume that he's 30. Just as in the 30th year, it doesn't say in the 30th year of his life, but we can connect it to this Passover. And we know that he's going to be dedicated as a priest um, or, or consecrated as a priest in those seven days that he goes into vision in, in Ezekiel chapter three. But we don't have, so when we go into our line and we go to 1989, <clears throat> when do we begin our um, consecration as a priest? 2019. Right. So you've got 2019. Now, a priest takes seven days to be uh, consecrated. Now, what happens? So this is November 9th, right? Because it's November 9th in 1989. And we have a period, now we're not setting a date here, we're just using this symbolically, December 25th, 2021. How many days is that from November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021? Not 504. No, this is 777 days, All right. right? So that's that structure that we had. And, and this is... For this movement, see, what people believed is that we're going to become priests on November 9th, 2019. That means we'll be consecrated. But if we look at the history back here on December 25th, 1991, this is the 777 days of the fall of the Soviet Union. And this 777 days, this is what Daniel, or not Daniel, what Stephen used to come up with this basic structure that's going to be here, uh, the 252 days and the 525 days. And there's more to it. But he took this 777 days. And when then, in this, when then would the priest mark their, the end of their consecration, that they're now priests? In December 2021. Yes, yeah, so December 25th, 2021. Now, I'm not setting that as a date. I'm just saying symbolically that's represented. Because one of the things we see about this line is that this line is symbolic. But if we take Ezekiel, we can say that Ezekiel gives us some details that we can apply to this line. And Snow gives us some details that we can apply to this line. But they don't give us all of the information by themselves. Now, one of the things... What is one of the basic principles of this movement? There's a lot of basic principles. But one of the, what is this movement founded upon methodologically? Line upon line. Line upon line. And what is line upon line? Precept upon precept. Comparing, 
contrasting different histories. Okay, so it's it's laying down different histories over top of each other. Now, we all have these different periods of darkness, right? So in every reform line, we can take that reform line and lay it over top of another reform line, and it's going to give us some information. We, we had this idea of the effect of every vision. That is, all these visions come together in this movement. Now, one of the ways that I sort of have pictured it is like the transparencies that you would have in a medical anatomy book where you would have, mm -hmm. you have this page and it's maybe a skeleton and then you take uh, a transparency, lay it over top and you can see maybe the, some of the nerves or you can see muscles or different, different organs when you, when you lay it over top will show up. And then eventually, you know, you finally overlay the skin and then you have a complete person and you've seen all the different parts or elements and that's what's happening in this movement. And so when we take something like Ezekiel and Snow, we need to recognize that they're not identical. That is, they're different histories, but they are telling us something about our history. And, and we can do this with other reform lines, but Ezekiel and Snow were specifically given to us as a symbol of this movement. Now, when we talk about this movement here, our movement, and we look at snow and we look at Ezekiel, there are, are certain points that come out that stand out in Ezekiel and certain points that stand out in snow. And we can see that those are gonna to come together in our line. Now, one of the things we know about Ezekiel, what is his prophesying based upon? What does he use as his starting point for his prophecy? In, in Ezekiel chapter 4 that he uses to predict the siege and ultimately the destruction of Jerusalem. What's it based upon? Uh, here for a day. Well, it's based upon the prophecy of Josiah, right? So remember, this was Josiah's Passover, but he also in 627, uh, that was the end of this, this prophecy of Josiah that he then used as the starting point of the prophecy of Josiah for 390 years and the starting point of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Josiah for the 40 years to predict the date of the siege, to predict the, the, the start of the siege. And he also used other elements within his, his life and his prophecy and his dates that actually pointed to the date of the destruction of Jerusalem. What's the symbol we get from Ezekiel? What's the main... Uh, chronological symbol that comes from the study of Ezekiel. The chronological symbol. So we ended up with Ezekiel. We made a prediction based upon that symbol. What symbol was that? Three ninety one point five. Okay. Day for a year. Okay, so somebody said day for a year. Someone said 391.5. The symbol is the 10th day of the fifth month. This is the date that Jerusalem is destroyed in 586 and also is destroyed in 70 AD. And, and, and this is an extremely powerful symbol. He makes a prediction with this date. Um, and it's, it's hidden. It's something that was not seen until recently. But this date, the 10th day of the fifth month, becomes the symbol that comes from Ezekiel. And it's a symbol of the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, Samuel Snow, now the 391.5, of course, is, is the thing that helps bring this symbol out. In Snow, what is the prophecy that he's using? Um, and what symbol comes from it? that we can use with snow? Uh, Josiah. Okay, so it's the prophecy of Josiah Litch, right? So we have Josiah Litch, so it's also Josiah, and it's 391.5, 391 years and a half of a month, so 0.5 of a month. But the symbol that comes from, from Josiah Litch's prophecy that snow is going to be using, even though he doesn't know he's using it, is what symbol? Uh, 
So we have the 10th day of the fifth month here. So this is about Jerusalem. And what symbol do we have that, that comes to play in Snow's history, even though we, it, it's kind of hidden? What's the symbol in snow? You should just answer it. I think so. Okay. Now, there are actually two symbols in snow. Now, how many days is it from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month? One eighty-seven. Okay, one eighty-seven. And if I add the first day of the first month, I take it as the number 11. And the fifth day of the fourth month, I take it as the number 52. And I take this as 15. And I take this as 107. And I add them together. What do they add up to? One eighty-seven. Okay. One eighty-seven, right? And one eighty-seven is a symbol of what? Eighteen days, six, seven months. Okay, so the eighteenth day of the seventh month, which is July seventh, mm -hmm. and Samuel Snow's last letter is published on July seventh, right? So Samuel Snow has this July, um, not July seventh, July eighteenth. Pardon me. Yeah. So it's July eighteenth, the eighteenth day of the seventh month, and Samuel Snow has this both in the fact that he stands here and gives the midnight cry and he says that this is this period of time and that he's at midnight he doesn't realize he's exactly there to the day so he he testifies of this 187 also three days before midnight he's going to have this these letters that are going to create a chiasm um, where, where may 2nd is going to be the center which is all, so this Kaya is discussing this, I'm not gonna go into detail here, but this is July 18th, that his last letter is published three days before midnight. But this July 18th symbolism is snow is connected to Josiah Lich's prophecy, just like uh, the 10th day of the fifth month is connected to Josiah's prophecy in Ezekiel. So the symbol that comes in, in Ezekiel's history is the 26th day of the fourth month. Now, he doesn't realize that, though. So he doesn't know about that. Neither does Ezekiel fully understand the 10th day of the fifth month because he knows Jerusalem ends up getting destroyed and the temple gets destroyed. But he doesn't know that he's predicting that. Now, there's also... Um, when, when we take these two symbols, do these two symbols come to play in our history? Yes. Right. And, and, and they clearly came to play in our history. One is, we did set a date using both of these symbols, but these symbols were understood as symbols before we even talked about setting dates. That is... I already had recognized back in 2015, the 26th day of the fourth month, that this was connected to Josiah Lich's prophecy. And in 2016, we came to understand the 10th day of the fifth month. And this was because we came to understand Ezekiel, not, not for setting a date of July 18th. We just came to understand Ezekiel and that Ezekiel and Lich were connected. And they were connected... Uh, by the Josiahs, so we know we knew that in 2016, and also the 391. So we understood that that connected these two. So in our history, we came to an understanding that, that Ezekiel and Snow were talking about the same thing, and we also came to understand these two symbols. Now, for many people, in 2018, when these were combined together, because both of these dates in our history in 2020, we know that in 2020, um, the 26th day of the fourth month is July 18th, Gregorian. And the 10th day of the fifth month is July 18th, Julian. So that fact um, is, is much more involved than that. 
But just the fact that that exists, that we could, in our history, take these two symbols, and that we could tie them together with this symbol that we had found, and, and 187, the symbolism from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, does anybody know when we discovered that in the movement? So we got this one uh, here in 2015. We got this one here in 2016. When did we find out about the 187 connected with uh, this structure from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month? Does anybody know? That was in 2014. So the building blocks of, of what has happened in our movement came from snow and Ezekiel. And these building blocks were built independently of each other, both in the history of, of their two different histories, but also in our understanding of them. But in our history, they come together, right? So we know that we have this July 18th date um, in 2020. So my point here is if we believe in the Bible, if we believe in what God has taught us, what God has led us into in this movement, we should see that these elements that are, are brought together in this structure, as, as we understand it, are elements that existed in previous prophecies. And there's, of course, much more to this than what, what I presented here. But the foundation of our message was that the time of the end began on November 9th, 17, or 1989. We already had that truth. When we came up with the November 9th, 2019 date, we just saw that there was 30 years, um, and we saw a significance in that. But we also know that this 30 years comes from the story of Joseph, comes from the story of Christ, and it comes from Ezekiel. And all of the parts of the puzzle that we are now understanding that we're going to address tomorrow in the prediction before midnight, because we're going to look at that, what that is, what it was in our movement, where it came from, came from elements in this movement, in this message, building blocks that were already being put together long before we even had a notion that we were going to set a date. These things became established in this movement. Now, I'm not saying that everybody understood them. They were on the record, that the videos exist. And every time this light began to come, these building blocks, uh, they ended up being disrupted in some way. Uh, different crises arose in the movement for various reasons uh, that distracted us from these things. But they came together in 2018, which I think is extremely significant. Any other, any other thoughts about this? Just in, in putting this down, I know it's, there's a lot more here than what we've, we've uh, looked at. But anything come to mind? Anybody want to make a comment about this? Are people hearing me okay? Yeah. You're coming through fine. Okay. Yeah, we're just spinning the wheel trying to keep up. I think so. Yeah, well, I understand that. But, you know, some of these things we're familiar with. I'm, I'm going to try to bring it together tomorrow in a simple way. I'm going to look at the prediction before midnight. So this was something that we had in our message in 2017, um, and it was connected with Snow's letters, though both the prediction before midnight and the chronology of Snow's letters was set aside by the movement. It wasn't, it wasn't officially rejected. It was just ignored, especially by Parminder. Um, he, he didn't want to attack it head on. He just avoided it and brought in other elements um, but we can see in, in what we're going to see tomorrow is we're going to see 
how this prediction before midnight is connected with Ezekiel and snow and, and other prophecies as well. But mostly I'm going to focus on Ezekiel and snow and try, try to give us an understanding of that, but also show it how it goes into the lines. And I've done some of that already. People have seen this, but I really want to put together a simple presentation tomorrow, not, not as messy as this, but a simple one that just illustrates this, that we can understand why we made this prediction and why it failed. Because actually the failure of the prediction is built into this structure. That is the prediction itself, the dates are not wrong. What is wrong is our interpretation of where they fit in the lines. And if we would have seen where they fit in the lines, we, of course, you know, you can't know what you don't know, but we, we, wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have been disappointed. We would have said, oh, this is a, uh, a symbolic line that we're in and we have these dates and we shouldn't expect an event. But of course, that really wouldn't work because it was necessary that we had those dates and that we believed that they were pointing to events. And some people say, well, then God was deceiving us or somebody was deceiving us. But the same thing happened in Millerite history. And, and all of those things, uh, those types of disappointments happen again and again in the various lines in, in different ways. Now, uh, just to try to close up, because I don't want to go long today. But one of the elements that we talked about and that I really want to build on uh, in the future because I'm going to, after we get through Ezekiel, which will probably be at Christmas time or something like that, um, I want to do a study where we're going to go over uh, our understanding as it grew and developed and unfolded from the beginning of this movement. And one of the things that we, we really need to, to look at is to understand the line upon line and how Jeff initially applied it and why it's correct but also how we got off track in our understanding of the line upon line and how it was manipulated. Um, so part of the confusion that we had with the lines, um, uh, you know, God allowed all those things. So God in his providence allowed these things to happen, but he allowed it so that we could see something. And, and that's what we're going to, to be exploring later on. But I'm just going to give tomorrow a very simple explanation of the lines and, and a connection between Ezekiel and snow. I didn't want to do this tomorrow because that would be really confusing. Um, and, if, and if somebody hasn't seen this, they can still understand what I'm going to present tomorrow. It'll just be a better understanding if you understand Ezekiel and snow and these connections. Any final comments or questions? Okay, any anyone else? These presentations make my Friday evening Sabbath begin in a great way. Oh, well, that's good to know. Yeah, I'm hoping, you know, that, you know, tomorrow when we, um, you know, when I, when I do the presentation tomorrow, I mean, I, I want to have discussion. Uh, I really want to spend some time uh, answering some questions because I know people have questions. And, and I'm not sitting there saying that I know all the answers to that either. Uh, because I think that there's there's still more that we need to understand. And all I understand is, is the things that, that I've worked through myself. Um, and there's a lot of other things in this movement, uh, other elements that I know are relevant, things that have been brought in by different people, that I know fit, that they fit into this, this whole puzzle. But a lot of these other things were also buried. And... You know, the fact that there was so much light being buried in this movement, um, you know, shows that, that there is in some ways that this movement is in a period that if we wanted, for lack of a better word, was a scattering, even though it's a reform line. Um, 
things were being undone. Uh, Satan was coming in and confusing things. And, and what that has done is it's, it's hardened some of us to actually look at some of these lines. There's some prejudices have arise, arisen, right? Some people want to go back to somewhere where there weren't, they weren't confused. And I think that the answer to not being confused is to actually go forward. I think that the, the clearness of what happened in our experience is understood as we continue on this path. And that if we turn back, mm -hmm. we're, we're going to actually go into darkness because this is what Ellen White says about the midnight cry. And if we deny the light behind us, we'll, our feet will go off the path and we'll go into darkness. So people, of course, could go into darkness even thinking that they're going forward on the path, thinking that they have light. So no analogy is perfect. But we have to, in order to know that we're going forward, what is it that we have to know? In, in just that illustration I used, what is it that we, we have to know in order to move forward on this path? That we can trust the light that's behind us. We have to trust the light that's behind us. Exactly. And so somebody who says they're moving forward, but is rejecting the light behind us, is not moving forward. Yeah, it's highly okay. minded. Yeah, I have an oddball question for you. Okay. Um, your point that with Ezekiel, that when he went into these visions, that that was summarily his anointing, his seven days preparation to become a priest. Yeah, that was his uh, uh, consecration or whatever to become a priest. And that, that's how I took it in Ezekiel 3. That he has symbolically, and it's a symbolic seven days, it's not literal. And when we look at our 777, even though we can put it on a calendar and say that there's these days, we now know that it's actually a symbol and that we're not looking for December 25th, 2021 to mark some event um, as we were before, because now we understand the symbolic nature of our lines. And, and it can say it's something internal, but we can't predict anything about it. We might be able to look back and say, you know, on December 25th, 2021, there was some significance about that date. But that's not really the point. It's the structure was given us, and the structure itself is symbolic. Uh, does that kind of uh, answer what you were saying? I, I didn't even, I didn't get to my question yet. Oh, okay. Okay. The, so what's the question? Okay. The, the, point, the point being, if, if Ezekiel had a symbolic time of consecration mm -hmm. and that we apply that to November 9th of 2019 being the 30th year of Future for America, mm -hmm. when is the time of consecration for Future for America? Okay, well, that's one of the things that in, in trying to understand who Future for America is, um, you know, Future for America, because, you know, Jeff didn't start Future for America in 1989, even though, you know, he's, he's the one who started Future for America, and so we can connect him to that. Um, you know, that's something that came later, but he did get the line upon line in 1989. That was the, the, the Bible study that he was doing. And, and I actually think in 1989, a lot of people were studying the same things. I was studying uh, Ellen White's statements regarding uh, the book of Daniel, that the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. But I also saw false representations that were happening at that time in 1989. People were misapplying Ellen White's statements and doing time setting with it even back in 1989, even earlier in 1987, 1986, 1985, people were setting dates um, that I knew personally, which is why I was opposed to time setting. I read so much on, in the spirit of prophecy against it. But the question then in trying to define what is FFA, 
in, if we're going to look at it in the lines, uh, where do we start it? Where do we start the priests? Um, are the priests equivalent to FFA, or are they are they different? Right? Are they are they connected in some way? I, I would say that the prediction before midnight um, is separate from Samuel Snow, just as Samuel Snow's letters are separate from Samuel Snow. So, and that's one of the things I'm going to address a bit tomorrow in, in laying out the prediction before midnight. And, and there's a bit more chronology stuff, and I don't want to confuse everybody with, with all the chronology, but we do have uh, symbols of FFA, which is the 22nd day of the sixth month, or 622, and also 627 are symbols for FFA, which come from Ezekiel as well. So one of the things we can see in Ezekiel is when he reaches back into the past, he's using two symbols, 622 and 627 those years. And those two, two symbols are symbols of FFA. So we can see that Ezekiel is connecting the symbols that have been connected with FFA that were not intentional, they just occurred. Uh, he's connecting those things. And we now can connect them uh, also with, with, uh, with Samuel Snow. So we can connect him with his third letter. So there's a lot involved. That, that's part of the problem. And what I want to try to do tomorrow is just present it in, in a, bit, a bit more simply, if, I, if that's actually possible for me to do. I keep losing my connection, but I, I want to ask, did you ever get to do your uh, commentary on Heather? On, on Daniel chapter 11? You're talking no, on Heather DeRosel's presentation. He was uh, asking if we'd, got, if we'd gone through that. No. And see, that's what we were going to do today. So I'm actually going to do that next Friday. So... I know I was supposed to do Heather's letter uh, today, which I, I, I kind of forgot about because I got caught up in what I was doing here. So, no, I didn't. And, and we need to do that. Um, so we'll do that next Friday. I probably should have done it this Friday, but I was so caught up in, in what I was going to present more, I completely forgot. So I apologize. And, and, and Pat's disappeared again. Um, yeah, we definitely do need to look at that letter that, that Heather wrote. So I forgot about it. A lot of stuff's been happening. Um, any, other, any other questions? Because we're gonna close with prayer here. Not at this point. We wanna go through Heather, Heather's letter now. <laughs> well that that would only take us what another um, hour maybe two yeah that would only take an hour or two but I think next next Friday should be good but yeah I really wanted to do this because because of what I'm doing tomorrow and that's what my mind has been in, involved in uh, for the last few days because I've been getting up like very very early and writing this paper. So that's all I've been thinking about is uh, these things. So we'll do that next time. We'll do Heather's, uh, Heather's letter next Friday. So, okay. So we can close with prayer. If there's no other comments. Dear father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we had to hear this evening the Sabbath. And we know, Lord, that uh, there's so many things we want to study and understand, and we just accept the things that you put before us each day. Help us to uh, digest these truths, to understand them. Um, we pray for the Sabbath and the meetings uh, that will be happening, the various presentations. And we know, Lord, that um, people will be making decisions as we go through the next few weeks, uh, spiritual decisions about their life and what they believe. 
And we just ask, Lord, that you can uh, help us uh, to represent you, that you can help us to make a proper choice. We can follow you wherever, wherever you go. And um, we pray for your angels to be around us, to protect us and guard us. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.